uh, very welcome to my talk about uh, my dissertation topics. So the title, as you can see, is uh, split up into three parts. So it's about spectral theory, control, and uh, higher regularity of one very abstract object, which I denominate uh, infinite dimensional operator equations. So all the models that I'm going to present you uh, are motivated from physics. And if you think of ancient Greece, when people started to explain what matter is made of, they came up with the four element theory, where they uh, said, well, I think we think everything is made up of the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. And this three of these uh, are also uh, the elements that my talk is made of. And uh, we will get into detail what these three pictures have to do with uh, the three elements of my talk. Let's start with the first one. The first picture, it looks like grass. And uh, so we are in the earth element of my talk. And it's about uh, the applicability of a approximation method for a certain type of differential operator. So our first model comes from quantum physics. And um, so a very uh, easy way to motivate this is to think of a single particle hopping on uh, the integer numbers. So we have here. Uh, so this art is in real life, and we mark some positions which correspond uh, to atoms here. Yeah, and now we have one electron, one particle that can be described in its position by an element uh, like an infinite vector. Yeah, so it just tells us is it at this position, at this or this. And um, now we want to model uh, like the behavior of this electron in the system. Does it jump? To the left, does it jump to the right, or does it uh, remain in its place? And one way to do this is uh, via a discrete Schrödinger operator. And these operators look like the following. So they have a potential on the diagonal, um, which I write like this here. So, and this potential is made up of just two different values zeros and lambdas, with lambda. Is also just um, a, a real number. Yeah. So, and we extend this periodically because we want um, our, our model to model a, a crystal. And a crystal is like a, a material that has some kind of um, translational symmetry in itself. So, if you go in one direction, the patterns you see, they will repeat. And um, here we would have like a pattern that uh, consists of like three objects and they repeat after and after uh, if I run along my uh, one dimensional crystal. In order to model this hopping to the left and to the right, we, we add something to this operator, which is a discrete Laplacian. And this is modeled by just adding ones here. And as it is an infinite model, we also continue these diagonals infinitely. So far for the model, um, the operator that we defined here is, is our discrete Schrödinger operator. And uh, we also can call it H. It stands for Hamilton. Potential is periodic. And the interest in an operator of this type comes from a method in uh, well, numerical analysis or functional analysis. Namely, we look at this operator H. And um, we ask ourselves, given a right-hand side B that is also of a vector form, do I find an X here? So is this equation solvable? Do I have for each B a solution X? So this is the question of the invertibility of this operator, which is classic in spectral theory. Now we come from the numerical viewpoint, asking, is it possible to approximate solutions to the system to this infinite dimensional system by uh, a cascade of um, finite dimensional system, which I denominate which with Hn. So we can think of this process as um, taking a sequence of uh, sections of our operator 
and also taking sections on our of our vector x and sections of our right hand side b and solving these finite dimensional equations on our computer and then well of course hoping that for n going to infinity the solutions to our finite dimensional systems approximate a solution to the infinite dimensional So, of course, so what are we looking for here? I have now described the type of operator, and um, we want to find out whether uh, there is a nice criterion that guarantees applicability of this, um, yeah, of this method, the finite detection method, um, to a given potential. So, if I give you a potential, consider um, consisting of zeros and lambdas, can I decide just by looking at this? Uh, of the sequence of values, whether this method will converge or not. So I think the audience cannot read what is here in the in the title. So I'm moving this somewhere where it doesn't bother too much. Maybe here. So and we want to characterize the applicability of this operator uh, by a so-called trace condition. How is this? How is this done? So we start out with a sequence in the kernel of this operator, and we uh, use the fact that we can um, now uh, use this this tree diagonal structure of the operator in order to formulate a recursion. The recursion formula um, can also be described via matrix multiplication. Once again, because we have three uh, diagonals. Um, we can just jump from one pair of values to the next by multiplying the two by two. We have a periodic potential. Here in the example, for example, we had a three periodic potential. And um, for every natural number, so we can think of a, of a periodically continued vector V. And each entry of the vector V giving rise to a so called transfer uh, matrix that we denote with T. Um, so, for a uh, for a k periodic operator, we will have k different of these transfer matrices, giving rise to a matrix M. And this matrix M will be the one that we want to closely look at in order to have a criterion to decide whether the um, finite section method is applicable or not. So, namely, we found out the following. Um, this is a joint work with uh, colleagues from Hamburg, Dennis Galaun, uh, Julian Grossmann, Marco Lindner, and Rico Ukena. Um, we found out that this trace condition, so calculating the trace and looking at the absolute value, checking whether it's greater than two, is already um, equivalent to the applicability of this procedure when uh, we have certain conditions on our potential. So the first criterion that we found is when our um, potential has a period length of four or less, then we can allow for every possible value of lambda. And then the only thing we need to check if we want to know if this uh, method works or not is, um, yeah, we need to calculate the space and check this place. So something seems to be happening for periods uh, k equal five and larger, and um, apparently this uh, criterion that we have breaks down. So we have to add additional assumptions or stronger assumptions to still guarantee the uh, convergence of this approximation. And we do this by restricting the um, the, the range or the, the allowed range of values for lambda from real numbers to Again, something seems to be happening for uh, k nine or larger, and yeah, there then uh, the method completely breaks down. Um, we the only thing that uh, that still works if we if we restrict to uh, potentials that have a value in them. All right. So how how can one uh, cook up a result like this? And um, one needs to take a look at the core of this uh, finite section method which uh, is a limit operator technique that I will uh, present you in a very special case. So 
maybe uh, if we start out with an operator like this, there are two types of matrices that we need to look at. And uh, they, um, they can be created by running along uh, this diagonal and shifting uh, the, the, ele the elements on the diagonal up or below. And then depending on the direction in which I run, um, there are uh, just, I think, 2K different operators one can get. And the next thing that one does is um, so-called, yeah, so we call it the compression. We restrict ourselves to just um, the positive half, so to say, of these operators. And then um, we get the following result. So this is classical theory. Um, the FSM is applicable if and only if the operator H is invertible, which is, I think, uh, a very natural assumption. If we want to solve the system, the operator should be invertible, so there exists a solution. And the second one relates to these uh, one-sided compressions. So also, um, these one-sided uh, compressions need to be invertible. And um, well, the language in this community it speaks of limit operators that one gets here. But in the special case of periodic Schrodinger operators that we have here, um, we can tone this down by the trace condition that we had before. And um, well, we've written the above in terms of, uh, of spectrum. We can still further simplify this result. Um, and this is what we did in the proof. So um, I'm not going into details, but uh, what happens is, oh, well, this is very interesting. Um, what happens is that uh, calculating the zeros that are in the, uh, in the discrete spectrum of these one-sided compressions, this corresponds to calculating roots of polynomials. And um, yeah, if the degree of the polynomial is not too high, one can solve the polynomial equation um, yeah, analytically with a computer. This is what we did for the range of um, potentials that I showed. Let's look at some images. So I told you that um, if the period length is less than four, then uh, the finite section method is applicable. How can we see this uh, if the trace condition is fulfilled? How can we see this if we look at the spectrum? Of one operator. So um, for us, only the red line of energies is interesting. And um, the green part are the parts uh, where the trace of uh, shifts of our um, operator uh, have a value less or equal uh, than two. Meaning, if I'm on this red line and I'm not in the green region, then my operator H is inverted. So we are interested in the values of lambdas that, that allow this conclusion. If I'm not in the green region, then I'm inverted. So the problem is now we do not only need to look at the green regions, we also have some uh, purple regions that come from these one sided compressions. So they add up uh, some Dirichlet eigenvalues that we also need to consider here. But um, the way of thinking is the same. So um, the purple line is not allowed to cross the red line. Um, in a, yeah, and if this is if this can be guaranteed for uh, for such a plot, um, then the finite section method is applicable to this specific type. So how does this plot look like when we uh, when we really uh, have a problem? This happens, for example, in the five periodic case. Here we can see that uh, for a certain value of lambda, we have a crossing um, of the red line. So um, this is a rational value. Uh, sorry, this is an irrational value. Uh, a crossing like this does not happen for periods less or equal than h at um, rational values. But it happens if we consider the period nine. There we find the following. So if we take the potential that is underlying here, and then um, well, calculate everything that we need to, we will see there's a purple line crossing the line. So far for the first topic. So quick uh, restart of our engine. We are coming now to the second element of this talk, which is water or more specifically coffee. So we have this cup of coffee and the question, uh, or what I want to say to you, uh, 
the example that I brought with me is the following uh, thought. If this, um, if you zoom in very much into this uh, into this cup of coffee, it will seem like an infinite lake. So there is no direction in which anything changes. So you could just think of um, a real line. And this real line just uh, marks the extent of our coffee region. It's infinite. And now something happens, namely um, at a certain time, let's say uh, t equals zero, someone uh, drops uh, a droplet of milk into your coffee. So what you then will observe, it's a distribution that looks like this. So in here we have like, 100% of milk and uh, outside of this radius, we have 100%. Now we let time evolve. What happens? Diffusion happens. Blurring out the droplets that we had and um, let's say at a certain time, capital T, we have now a, a distribution of milk and coffee that may be a little bit flatter. Yeah? So maybe it's not 100% milk here anymore, but just one and a half, so 50% here. And now we ask the following question. So we want to have some information over this final state of our coffee milk system. Yeah? Uh, and what we are going to look at is, um, is the integral below this curve. So we want to know what is the integral over u at t integrated over all x. So absolute value, but so for concentration, they are always positive. So can we estimate this under uh, the following assumption or the following problem. So suppose we do not have access to the whole uh, coffee milk distribution, but we um, have placed some sensors on the real line that can measure the concentration at a, at a specific point, but not at every point. So we do not have the complete access uh, we have not complete access uh, to all the information of the file state. And um, so what happens now is, um, so we still want to come up with an upper bound. So we do not have direct access to this, but we want to estimate this, uh, this integral here. So what, what now um, is the additional consideration is, so let's do we have a, have a blind spot. So there is a region where we cannot measure anything. We do not have any information on the distribution at all. Yeah? So, but what we can still measure is uh, the value of u on a certain sensor set, which we call uh, omega of t here. So um, maybe let me write this here. The omega of t is the sensor set, and this is like uh, the complement of a blind spot. The blind spot is where I can't measure, and the sensor set is where I can measure. And now, so I'm, I'm, I have the whole trajectory that you also see uh, on the two dimensional plot here. I have access to this whole trajectory minus the trajectory on the blind spot. So my hope is that I can estimate or find an estimate that integrates or samples the distribution over this whole time, but only uh, on the sensor set. And the question is if I can find something like this. And um, if I can, then uh, we have something that we call uh, observability. So, so we can, uh, can observe or we have information on the final state of our system in terms of an integral estimate on the final state. So what about movement? So what, is, what happened here is we have a, we have a blind spot that is fixed in time. But what about something like this? So a blind spot that is that is moving, that is extending, 
this is a um, non autonomous uh, addition to the problem that I'm seeing here. So um, I already marked it here. So uh, our sensor sets can now depend on time, such as the blind spots. So they also the question still stays the same. Do we have a final state observability estimate? But now, for the case of uh, moving uh, blind spots or moving sensors, there's even an additional component that brings uh, non autonomy to it. If you uh, stick to the coffee example for one, uh, for one more time, namely the coffee or the, um, the physical properties of the coffee change also over time when the coffee cools down. So the diffusion that you see here may also not uh, work the same way from zero T zero to capital T half than in the second half because of changing material properties over time. This is another addition that we consider here. Let me show you the result that we found out um, for this specific type of diffusion problems, namely. So in a more mathematical manner, one can describe this coffee distribution milk example by diffusion. And diffusion um, can be described by using uh, uniformly strongly elliptic polynomials. And um, this evolution process of a profile I can describe via a Fourier multiply. But just think of the coffee distribution. I have access to it at every point in time by plugging it in to this operator. So now comes an interesting geometric part to it. Of course, I cannot allow every type of blind spot. I need to have some geometric description on blind spots such that something can happen. If I'm completely blind, there is no, no chance in order to estimate this problem. So how large can the blind spots be? And uh, we formulate this in a, in a more positive way, talking about the uh, sense of sex. How thick must the sensor set be? And um, in our case, we use the following notion of thickness. Namely, um, so the idea here is that um, this set omega does not have holes that can grow arbitrarily large. And we model this by saying that for, uh, so for all x of my space Rd, um, if I take a look at the ball with center X and radius L, I need to estimate the Lebesgue measure by a constant rho and the constant L to the D, which are fixed. They don't, do not depend on X, and um, they also do not depend on T. So this is what we mean with uniform. It does not depend on T. So, um, so there exists rho and L. Um, so, so to check for all t in my sampling interval, I have an estimate like this. And if this is the case for my family of um, sensor set, then I call this family uniform. And now we get the following result. So I hope it still looks similar to the one that we derived here as our uh, as our wish. On the left hand side, we have the integral, but written as an L1 norm. So this is just an abbreviation. And on the right hand side, I have an observability constant. I have the sampling over time. And I have an integral over my um, census. So that's not all. We can increase uh, the power of this result by first saying that maybe I do not need to sample the whole time. It suffices. To sample on a measurable subset that still has non zero measure. So it would suffice to maybe just measure this portion here and to still have access to this information. Of course, the constant that we have will change. The constant will depend on how I choose my E, but um, we can allow this. So the second thing that we can tune is uh, the range of um, integrability that we allow for our observations. So we can now allow for every R from one to infinity. Actually, we can also allow R equal to infinity, but this a bit of one to blow up this result too much. And the last portion of complexity or power that we can add is we can also add P integrability. 
So um, we can already, so the question is whether we measure here uh, the first moment or higher moments of this uh, distribution. And this is also allowed by this result. Okay, so far we have geometric conditions on our sensor sets that allow us to conclude the existence of the final state observability estimate. Now we do the opposite. Assume that someone comes to you and says, look at this uh, system of uh, milk and coffee. I can show you that I have this property for a family of sensor sets. And now the question is, which geometric uh, requirements does your family of sensor sets fulfill? This is the next thing that I want to talk about. So we start out with the same. We have our coffee system modeled by a strongly elliptic polynomial, a Fourier multiplier, and we also allow sampling on a, on a subset E. Assuming, so this is always abbreviated version of that we saw before. Assuming we have final state observability, what do we have for our um, family of sensors? And what we can prove is not this uniform property, but a weaker property. Namely, let me add this. So we close this down and we say, so now our family is not uniformly thick, but it's thick in a mean sense. Uh, what, what does this mean? Um, we integrate from zero to T and just take the average of these measures. And if the average over uh, our sampling interval um, is greater or larger, once again, uh, a constant or two constants that do not depend on T, uh, then we say our family is mean thick. And this is a necessary condition in order to derive estimates, uh, final state of stability estimates of this. So what does this mean? Uh, as an example, so this could be the family of mean thick set. I have here completely thick. I have the whole space. Then I do not measure at all. And then again, I measure thick. Or I can also do something like this. And never thick. At no point in time, I have, to, uh, I have a thick set that I'm measuring um, because my blind spots are just too large. Still, um, this could happen. So this, this would be a... Uh, yeah, this would be an example of uh, the mean thick family of uh, sensor sets. So, of course, we can also reformulate this uh, result in an even more abstract setting. And this is actually where our investigations started from. There's a strategy called the Rodiano strategy that can be used in order to formulate, like, uh, yeah, like the plan of things that one has to check for a certain model uh, to prove. The existence of these estimates. And um, yeah, this is a result that uh, we derived together with uh, colleagues um, Lena Frombach, Christian Seifert, and Martin Hauptmann, um, which is, well, I need to, my evolution to be described by uh, yeah, some sort of uh, operator family that is well behaved. Um, I also need now observation operators. So what, what I saw, what I modeled here was just description. So a set is now modeled via uh, an observation operator. Uh, for this operation operator, I need two certain compatibility conditions that are called uncertainty and dissipation. Um, yeah, one can check that these conditions hold in our case of the elliptic uh, polynomials. And um, the important fact is that we can balance out these two effects, uncertainty and dissipation. There are two um, factors in the exponents, gamma one and gamma two, and we need uh, gamma two to be strictly larger than gamma one in order to derive final state of stability. This is just some insight into the proof. So this is uh, this is where what it comes down to. Once again, part reset. We are now at the third element of the talk, which is air, and we want to talk about flying or better a model that uh, helps us to explain why airplanes fly. And before I do this, I quickly make some space on the blackboard. So 
the model, as I already told you, comes from um, yeah, the modeling of, of fluids, fluids like air, for example, and is uh, is called the Navier-Stokes equations. They can be also model used to model uh, other liquids other than air, but um, we just use the airplane example. And as you may know, for the three-dimensional case, this is a highly uh, non-trivial uh, uh, object to study. That one it, it talks about existence of and uniqueness of solutions. Um, yeah. So if you need uh, or want to win a million dollars, so there is a price if you can prove it in a certain setting for these equations. What we will do is we will stay in the two-dimensional setting where um, the existence and uniqueness of solutions in a certain regularity class is already proven. And um, we want to show that these solutions are actually better than one would expect. So we're in the airplane and we look outside the window and notice the wing. So I'm talking about the two-dimensional problem. So we take an intersection of the wing and uh, we see it's shaped something like this. Yeah? So have like a droplet like shape here. And now what happens is so the fluid that surrounds our wing uh, exerts pressure from below and from above. And this pressure turns into force. Why is there pressure? Well, um, the pressure comes from the liquid that moves around. But it's faster on the upper side and lower on the upper side. And this leads to a higher pressure on the lower side than on the upper side. And therefore, our plane looks off. So the domain that we consider, we can think of like a control volume like this. That's sufficiently large with boundaries that have uh, yeah, sharp edges. Also. also in the interior, um, this profile that we have is not completely smooth. It can also have some edges here. Um, this is what, what, what we can say is an example for a Lipschitz domain, Omega. So Lipschitz continuity means, okay, I do not have very round borders, but well, it's not, it's not discontinuous, right? So, um, and now um, I already mentioned the two main players of our model, which are velocity and pressure. And if you start out with uh, the physical model um, in a classical way, you would say, well, um, uh, the um, second Newton's uh, axiom tells us that the, the change of velocity needs to equal a force. Uh, so the um, acceleration times mass needs to be a force. So the force that we have here is, is a pressure that we denote with P. And what changes is um, also the velocity. So we have the um, derivative of the velocity and also change in pressure. And we could also think about an external pressure that also has an influence on our system. So I just add and add also. There's a further assumption that this model comes with, which uh, sometimes is denoted as incompressibility. What this means is, if I have a fixed volume in here and I let this volume move, of course, it's a fluid. It may not maintain its shape. This is like a characterization of fluid. There is a force here that may just bend. So let's say after some time, my volume looks like this. Incompressibility means that the volume will still have the same volume, even though uh, the boundary shape changed. And the way we model this, is by saying the divergence of our velocity field is zero. Okay. So what does do we now mean with higher regularity and allocation? Um, so higher regularity of Lerenhoff solutions to this equation. So let me um, rewrite this term here by uh, expanding the differential. So, so these are the Navier-Stokes equations in the incompressible case when we also add 
uh, an initial condition with zero and also a boundary condition um, that tells us like uh, our fluid sticks to the boundary of our condition. So this is like a Dirichlet boundary condition in this case. And now a solution to the system is um, yeah, it's in the Larry Hobbs class, which means it's a, it's a regularity class that tells us something about the integrability and the um, uh, tells us something about the integrability and the differentiability. So why do we need this? Integrability is important because if you take a close look at this model, it's modeled at the particle level. So at the infinitely uh, small particles. But in fact, if we are interested in the physical quantities, we need to integrate about them to give a region a certain volume or a certain um, yeah, impulse. So um, we need integrability. And of course, there are differential operators everywhere. We also need differentiability. Let's see how I'm doing. So now, I told you the uh, finding solutions to integration is not easy. But if one is in the Hilbert space case, there uh, is this uh, class of Larry Hopp solutions. And one can uh, say that, um, so solution U solves uh, the Navier Stokes equation, and U is in the Larry Hopp class, which you can think of like a mix of uh, different. Uh, regularity classes. So it tells us we are L infinity in the time and L2 without divergence in space. So the spaces that we consider all, always carry two types of regularity, one in time and one in space. The second one is always in space. And we have also L2 uh, regularity in time and then some differentiability in space. And we also denote that this space that we are in encodes, so this uh, soberless space encodes this uh, um, this boundary condition here. Therefore, we write a zero here. And the sigma means that um, our fields are divergent. So what do I now mean with increasing regularity? I think I already told you what we are looking for. So two parameters that we want to increase. And um, so in fact, if one looks at this one, one would say, well, what about the time derivative? Where, where are they accounted for? And um, so the idea now is that um, if we are on a Lipschitz domain and we, let's say, we formulate a wish on higher regularity in, uh, in respect to, to time and to space, the time regularity we need, uh, let S denote this time regularity and P, the one in space. Then for a, a weak delay of solution, um, we need some further assumption on our initial value and our uh, external force at zero in order to show that um, actually our solution is a little bit better than, uh, than the one that we had before. So let me maybe told you this result that uh, I found together with uh, Patrick Tolstoy. Um, so, we are now uh, have Sobolev regularity in time and uh, LP regularity in space. And um, we also have yeah, integrability of order S with values in the domain of an operator that I still need to specify. But uh, let's say that this is also better than before. We can do the same also in other spaces. So in distributional spaces, we can also show uh, that for a certain input sets of parameters um, and certain conditions on our initial value and the external force. So now we are considering um, distribution spaces for this. We can also find a similar result. And so if you compare to anything, and the one that has changed is the space regularity here. The time regularity is uh, is, is uh, for this regard. Right. So how can we how can we come to such a result for this nonlinear system? Um, I need to rewrite the system a little bit in order to motivate better what what we aim for. 
So the main philosophy of this approach is to solve the nonlinear system by taking a look at the linear part. So in order to see the linear part, I rewrite the system as follows. I take everything that is linear in U and in P on the one side, and on the other side, I put the stuff that is uh, not linear in U. And now we consider this, uh, ah, sorry. Maybe like this. So now I consider the linear portion of the system, meaning linear in the two variables u or the two unknowns u and p. So the linear part of the system is precisely this. And uh, this is called the Stokes system. The linear part of Navier Stokes is called the Stokes system. And the operator that I wrote down briefly below, this is the Stokes operator. And the realizations of this operator on certain LP spaces are realized by putting a P in the um, sub index here. And so, for the last minutes, let me tell you how this uh, road works if one starts out with a linear form. So, maybe let's first, um, let me first tell you how we can describe Levy Hop solutions in a uh, yeah, more I let them I haven't described them yet. I have just told you which regularity they have, but you can write them down with um, yeah via an integral. So in particular, a Levy Hopf solution to the Navier Stokes equation fulfills an integral equation that has a first part that may seem familiar from um, ordinary differential equations. So this is just a variation of constant formula. And this is precisely the part that also corresponds to the linear system. Yeah, so I have here uh, the part of, um, of the velocity, and I also have a part that corresponds to my operator A. Now the derivative makes this just work. So for the nonlinear part, we have something else, and this looks a little bit um, yeah, uh, complicated at first, but um, we do not need to get uh, into too much details. The only thing that you need to observe is here we have formulated everything with a two. Below. Yeah, this is the Hilbert space case, which uh, in which uh, the result is already known for a long case and was proven by methods that um, well are exclusive to the Hilbert space case. Once we leave this case of the Hilbert space L2, we need a different methods in order to conclude the similar result. Namely, the idea, so to shorten it up. We want to substitute every two that isn't there by a p in order to get regularity not on an L2 space, but on an LP space. So how does one do this? Um, so first one one needs a good result for the L2 Dirichlet problem um, that I just stated here. So this is in some sense the problem that you have here, but with a resolvent parameter and no time, so station. The interesting thing here is uh, we need like an estimate on the boundary values versus um, the uh, initial uh, the condition on uh, the bound. So we do not have a, we do not have a Dirichlet boundary here, and we somehow want our solution or the trait of our solution to depend continuously on the traits that I put in. Oh, so much. So the next thing. That I cannot go into details is we need a reverse Hölle estimate that somehow classifies or quantifies how non local an operator works. Um, then we need to prove R sectoriality of our um, operator. This is for the semi group part. And um, in the end, we get a maximal regularity result for the, the linear system that so philosophically tells you. Um, if I have a system like this one, and I put in a right hand side with a specific regularity, and I have a solution, then at first, the only obvious thing to say is okay, the left, the whole left part as a as one object has the same regularity as the right. 
maximal regularity now tells us um, what would be the best thing to expect? Well, to have every um, single element on the left hand side have the same regularity as the right. It's a vector space, so addition does not um, would not destroy this regularity. And we need this uh, in the space of our time regularity. So we need maximal and S regularity. And um, with that, we are already at the end of my talk. So some things to take home in form of in, uh, images and messages. So in the first part, we talked about the element of earth or grass. So approximation method and a computer check uh, in our proof. In the second part, we talked about copy and diffusion models and how um, blind spots make our life a little bit difficult if we want to estimate something. And in the last part, we talked about uh, airplanes and why they fly and what we can tell about solutions to this uh, physical problem in terms of higher regularity. Thanks.